All right, welcome. Thanks for joining us either on YouTube and for the folks that are here on Zoom sharing this practice and intention tonight. And uh, I'd like to share a sutta, that, a teaching that is, is um, a new one to me that I've been exploring today um, called the simile of the mountains. For those that like to follow along, I'll put the links um, down below in the YouTube recording. And uh, here on Zoom, I'll remind me at the end of the recording, it's in the Samyutta Nikaya 3.25. Um, if you're, if you like to read those, and huh, so it's um, it's an interesting little story retelling of um, there was this king Pasanadi of Kosala, so the kingdom is Kosala, and the capital of the kingdom is called Savati, and this story happens in Savati where this king who was a, quite a follower and supporter of the Buddha um, built many monasteries um, for, for the Buddha and, and the monastics. And um, he came and, and met with the Buddha and bowed and sat to one side. And the Buddha said to him, well now, great king, where are you coming from in the middle of the day? And uh, this king replies, um, and it, this is written in probably <laughs> not how it would have been said, but uh, we get the idea. Um, just now, I was engaged in the sort of royal affairs typical of a head anointed noble warrior kings. Typical of head anointed noble warrior kings. So they've been anointed. These are the highest ranking noble warrior kings that we're meeting. Uh, and uh, I, I was engaged in the kind of business that we do, us head anointed warrior kings. Uh, and then he describes it intoxicated with the intoxication of sovereignty. Sovereignty means the authority to rule. So intoxicated with the power, with the authority to rule over others and obsessed by greed for sensual pleasures, all the wonderful things we can have and buy and get and want and take from others and um, et cetera. And um, also those who have attained stable control in their country and who rule having conquered a great sphere of territory on earth. This just really resonated with me, of course, because of the state of constant war we're in, um, uh, we live with and in this on this earth, but uh, in particular, uh, what's happening with Russia and Ukraine and many countries around the world of Whoever has the most power wins and takes what they want. And so the Buddha says, what do you think, great king? Suppose someone trustworthy and reliable were to come to you and say, if it pleases your majesty, you should know that I come from the east. And there I saw a great mountain as high as the clouds. Picture that. I don't know if you've seen seen Mount Everest or some other great mountain, you know, where you're like, I remember when I was in Nepal and I thought, oh, there's the mountains. And then the next day the clouds cleared. And I was like, oh my goodness, there's the mountains, like that big. Um, great mountain as high as the clouds, coming this way, crushing all living beings in its path. Picture that force and that size and that that power that can't couldn't be stopped by um, any number of armies or any amount of wealth, and it's crushing all the life forms, all the plants, all the animals, all the humans, all the beings in its path. 
And so then as these stories often go, then another person comes from the West saying the same thing is coming from the South and from the North. So from all directions is coming in, crushing everything, destroying everything. <sighs> um, yeah, there is a great mountain as high as the clouds coming this way, crushing all living beings. Do whatever you think should be done, this person says to the king. If, great king, such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of, it says here, human life, but we could just say life. Um, the human, but then it does go on to say, the human state being so hard to obtain, what should be done? And this kind of segues to another sutta here that I'll try to keep brief, but where they're saying here, the human state so hard to obtain, this, uh, there's another, Sutta called the Chigala Sutta. I'll put the link under in the YouTube recording, which is translated as the whole. And it's it speaks about how extremely rare and precious it is to have a human birth. And to have a human birth, what also to have a Buddha, an awakened being, and to have a human birth in at a time when there is awakened beings. And um, so it's described this way. It's a wonderful, evocative teaching. And so picture this, the, the whole earth, the whole earth covered in water. And if someone was to toss a yoke, you know, like how they would yoke a oxen, a wooden yoke that has a one hole in it. It's got like one loop in this um, yoke, and they toss that onto the water that's covering the whole earth. And then the winds from the east push it to the west, the winds from the west push it east, north and south. It just gets pushed around all over the place all the time, moving, moving, moving. And then uh, some of the suttas say a blind sea turtle, some say a one eyed sea turtle. We'll just go with blind. A blind sea turtle comes up to the surface once every 100 years for a breath. Okay, it's blind. <laughs> it only comes up for a breath once every 100 years. There's this one yoke with a hole floating around the whole earth, <laughs> moving all the time in all directions. And then what do you think? Um, what are the odds of that blind sea turtle when it surfaces putting its nose through that yoke with the single hole? And it's said that's how rare and precious a human birth is. This is talking about rebirth in all the different realms and, and being born a human is considered very, mm, in some ways even better than the heavenly realms because in the heavenly realms everything's perfect and we just get stuck there <laughs> here we're we're in this muck that we've been talking about um in the the zoom room before of the joys and the sorrows and the suffering of that is part of this human life and that is a precious opportunity to awaken um, yeah, so this is, um, this is what they mean in this first teaching about the mountains when they're talking about, um, the human state being so hard to obtain. A little side note there. Um, and so then the king answers, so, you know, we're reflecting on what, um, what should be done with all of these um, forces coming in? Um, and the king answers wisely because he's a student of the Buddha. Uh, um, if Lord Buddha, such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of human life, the human state being so hard to obtain, 
what else should be done but dhamma conduct, right conduct, skillful deeds, meritorious deeds. So if we really realized the preciousness and really realized the immediate danger, we would be compelled to skillful conduct, non-harm, non-stealing, no, not harming with our sexuality or sensuality. Um, yeah. Um, and so the Buddha then describes these four mountains. Uh, well, the dogs are going to sound off one second. Um, he, he says, I inform you, great king. Oh, dear. One sec. We got the dogs. Um, let me just put on this extra filter here. Remove noise. Let's see if that helps. I found it doesn't really, but I'll try. Uh, so the Buddha says, I inform you, great king. I announce to you, great king. Aging and death are rolling in on you. These, we are all aging every moment, every breath. Every moment, every breath, we are closer to death. We have this rare, precious opportunity, this human birth. Um, and we need to, it can, can be skillful to really pay attention to these pressures. This, um, this story goes on. Um, the king talks about, you know, what's happening in our world right now. And with, within each of us personally, to some degree, I, I would say, uh, unless we're fully enlightened, um, he describes, um, there are elephant battles fought by head anointed noble warrior kings, intoxicated with the intoxication of sovereignty, obsessed by greed for sensual pleasures, who have attained a stable control of their country, and who rule having conquered a great sphere of territory, but there is no use for those elephant battles. No scope for them when aging and death are rolling in. And then he goes on, it often is done in these teachings where they repeat it, and, but he goes, so at first he's talking about great elephant battles, really big battle. And then he says the same thing for cavalry battles, chariot battles, infantry battles. There's no use for them when aging and death are rolling in like these four mountains. And then he goes on further, and this is maybe something we can relate to more. In a royal court, there are counselors who when enemy or enemies arrive, they are capable of dividing them by their wits. So it's another way to go to war with someone, conquer them with your wit, <laughs> out argue somebody. I mean, I think we can all relate to that one to some degree. Uh, or I could be just personally projecting a lot. <laughs> you know, where we're like so many being on opposite sides of so many issues and trying to convince someone, trying to, and uh, they're saying the same thing. There's no use for these battles of wit, no scope for them when aging and death are rolling in. And then he also goes on, um, in this royal court, there's abundant wealth and gold stored in the vaults. With such wealth, we, wealth, we are capable of buying off our enemies when they come. But there's also no use in this when aging and death come rolling in on these four mountains. Um, and so as aging and death are rolling in, what should be done? Dharma, Dhamma conduct, right conduct, skillful deeds, meritorious deeds.
And the Buddha, of course, affirms his, his uh, seeing it clearly and wisely. So it is great king. So it is great king. And he agrees with them. Um, and so, you know, this refers to in thought, word, and deed. I would add intention. The, our intention um, What, what's the word Col colors or um, conditions our actions our intentions affect our speech so you know to to look closely at, at our intentions and to see that engaging in battle to whatever degree with our wealth and privilege or with our uh, arguments and wit or with our actual physical battles in some cases um, is not considered skillful in this teaching. So what does it what what would be considered skillful? Non harm. So what actions what speech, what intentions move us towards not causing harm, not taking what isn't freely given, um, not, not causing harm with intoxicants, not speaking falsely. So we can phrase all that in the positive. These are phrased in the negative, but we can rephrase them as generosity is the opposite of not taking what isn't freely given. Uh, loving kindness is the opposite and compassion is the opposite of harm or, or it's non-harm phrased positively. Um, There was another thought there that just slipped away. Um, yeah, so not not harming, not taking mm, generosity. Oh, and and so skillful speech, wise speech. Um, yeah, there's so much more that we could explore around what would be a skillful response, which maybe we'll, after the recording, we'll have a discussion here in the Zoom about that. Um, yeah, so I just found this teaching inspiring because I could just kind of really feel that visceral sense of the worldly pressures coming in and, and the Buddha is saying, ah, you know, those, those mountains are actually aging and death that are coming in on us from all directions all the time that we tend to ignore and to notice it and use that to wake up to the preciousness of this human birth and the preciousness of this time and what we're going to do with our resources and our energy to be of service to others, to offer um, support to others in ways we can, um, offering respect and protection through our values and ethics and morals, um, by practicing our meditation and purifying our hearts and minds, listening to the Dharma, being clear around our intentions. These are all ways of um, that are being called to in this teaching. Yeah. There's a further teaching on the 10 meritorious deeds, but can't go into that tonight. Maybe we'll do that another time, but it, they're mostly summarized by what I already what I just said anyways, um, cultivating skillfulness, ethical 
behaviors and generosity. So let's have a practice and uh, which is one of these ways of right conduct is um, cultivating wise mindfulness. So let's do that now. So if you're um, in a need to change your posture or change your lighting, you can practice laying down, standing or walking. Um, get any supports you need to be as still and as comfortable as possible. All right. So take your time to make sure your body is upright and supported and as relaxed as you can be. See if you need any movements to release any tension or deeper breaths, cleansing, clearing, energizing breaths. And as the body comes to rest, see what is a supportive position for your eyes might be resting closed, it might be with a relaxed gaze downward, or the eyes resting in a wide gaze um, out of a window. What helps you to stay, to, not to stay, but to invite ease and wakefulness? Then we'll begin with some time just relaxing any habit tensions that you notice, inviting peaceful expression. Checking in with the areas of protection that have snuck into the body, perhaps across the shoulders or in the tongue, in the belly or the hands. See if it feels helpful to release or relax, soften to some degree or a lot. And as the tensions that aren't needed in this moment find some release, we may then feel a bit more connection with ground. Directly feeling the sensation of our relationship to this earth. Nothing separate. Supported by the earth, hopefully also supporting the earth. And if there's a lot of sleepiness for you at this time, depending on the time of day and the body, 
you might find it helpful to allow yourself to receive some energy from the earth as if it's moving up through your spine, bringing up brightness. And then we'll bring into our practice a little bit of contemplation tonight on this teaching of the whole earth covered with water. Or maybe an image of that, or just a sense of that, or just a concept of that. And then there's a, a wooden yoke with a single hole floating on that water of the whole earth. And all of the winds from the east pushing that to the west, from the west pushing it east, from the north pushing it south, and south pushing it north. So it's constantly moving and changing its location. Imagine, feel, conceive of that for a moment. And then this blind or one-eyed sea turtle lives there in that water. And it only comes up to the surface once every 100 years for a breath. And how very rare and precious it would be for that sea turtle once every 100 years to stick its neck into that yoke with the single hole. Breathtakingly unlikely and rare. And it is likewise considered that rare and precious that one obtains a human birth. And that one has a human birth in a time when there's been a Buddha, an awakened one. And that those, we have the opportunity to know these teachings. Feel the energizing of this, the preciousness of this. What does that feel like in your body, heart, mind? And I'll be quiet for a few minutes now and you can just feel into this in whatever way is supportive for you.
And this teaching of the sea turtle goes on to clarify that this is why we practice. This is why it is our duty to use this precious time to understand suffering, stress, its cause, its ending and the way to its ending. And so we might also include in our contemplation practice tonight, what ways are we doing battle? Dividing by our wits, And then as the Buddha has taught this great king, also teaching us that with aging and death rolling in on us, what should be done is right conduct, skillful deeds, generosity, morality, our commitment to non-harm, not stealing, our commitment to respect and kind speech, providing service in helping others. And part of generosity is the sharing of the merits that we have received. So we can take some time to contemplate, reflect, feel how we have been supported.
Another aspect of generosity is rejoicing in the merit of others. The good fortune of others and rejoicing in that. And then take some time now to reconnect with a little check-in with the body, relaxing the face, shoulders, belly, hands. Reconnect with the support of our relationship with the earth. And then we can feel into the space and the protection that skillful action gives us, calming the heart and mind, protecting ourselves and others from harm, So you might be able to feel a sense of spaciousness, connection.
for these last few minutes of practice. You can either just rest in this felt experience of skillful intention, mindfulness, or you might find it supportive and helpful to use some phrases to cultivate and anchor your intention. Just trust what intuitively comes for you, perhaps. May my actions be skillful. May my intentions be wholesome. May my speech be kind. And if you want, including others, may you be safe from harm. May you find support and steadiness in the midst of this suffering. We'll have a few more minutes of quiet here. And one of the meritorious deeds that falls under the heading of generosity is called the sharing of merits. So we'll close our practice now by sharing the merit. May any, any skillfulness, wholesomeness, merit of our practice and our hearing the Dhamma, reflecting on the Dhamma, Reflecting on these teachings of skillfulness. May any wholesomeness, skillfulness, goodness of this be for the highest good of all beings. There may be certain beings or groups of beings that in your heart, mind, you wish to offer the merits of your practice to. You could do that now. And as I 
ring this bell three times, feeling this vibration moving out to all beings. Thank you for your practice and joining us. If you're um, watching the recording after, I'll put the links down below to the teachings that I referred to and um, hope to see you again. Thank you.